Hi, I'm Sandy Gumpf. I'm uh, an associate professor for in infectious diseases and I'm uh, chief of ID at the VA. We're going to talk tonight about uh, food safety in America. And I thought I, as originally when I was trying to come up with a topic for this, um, I was going to do hot topics in infectious disease, go over some of the uh, recent uh, news, recent uh, board type questions. But the more I started looking into the whole food safety thing and really realizing how little I know about it really, I thought it would be interesting to, to go over it and, and give you all an idea of, of what it is right now. So what do you know about food safety? And do you know what, what's on your plate right now, where, where it came from? <laughs> do, you, do you really know what, what it is, where it came from? where it grew, how many steps. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but do you know how many steps has, has it gone through from the time that it was in the field to the point where it got to your plate? How many people have touched your food? <laughs> and how do you counsel patients who might ask you these questions because you're infectious disease specialists? <laughs> so th it turns out there are quite a number of steps uh, from the source, uh, from the farm to your table. You start off at the farm, your raw materials uh, for the most part, it's either animals or their products uh, and produce, fruits, vegetables. Uh, from there they might, you might get straight to you as a direct-to-consumer uh, sale at a farmer's market or a CSA. Um, or there might be some, usually there's some form of middleman, a distributor, uh, some retailer like uh, Publix. And uh, at some point, for most products right now, there is a, pro a processor involved, either a production uh, directly producing uh, or processing a product, or they may themselves outsource to a third party uh, manufacturer. From there, that product may come back to the main uh, plant or it may just go on to another distributor, either the company's distributor or, again, a, a third-party distributor. Uh, then uh, after that, you, it arrives at a retailer or a number of retailers and eventually to you. And I'm not really going to uh, talk ver at all about imports because that's an entirely separate process. But a number of th items on your plate might, might actually be imports. So again, I'm uh, not going to belabor the point, but as far as things that farms have to do, the, obviously they have to use safe methods of growing, um, they have to, and harvesting, packing, transporting uh, materials to processors. The processors have to follow FDA guidelines uh, to avoid contamination, cleanliness. They have to have an educational process for their employees. And they also have uh, critical control points that they have to monitor for safety. Transportation, of course, is important. Uh, how many trucks and containers do you see that you know are clean? Um, any cold foods, there's a requirement that they have to be refrigerated at a certain temperature at all times. I, and uh, once they get to retail or a restaurant, there are food codes that they have to follow uh, for the FDA. Uh, they have to pass local health inspections, train their staff. Consumers themselves have some responsibility in learning about what you're eating um, and being careful about preparation so that you don't get sick. Well, as far as uh, food safety law, it for the most part started in 1906. Uh, before uh, that point, uh, when the Federal Food and Drugs Act was uh, uh, enacted. Uh, Harvey Wiley was a prominent chemist and physician who advocated for some sort of regulatory process. Uh, at the time there was a lot of, you know, y you could put out a bottle of anything and say it did anything and you didn't, there was no way to guarantee the ingredients or purity um, or safety. So from then on a number of acts uh, were were enacted 1927 the Federal Import Milk Act, Food Drug and Cosmetic Act 1938 um, and we, the, the, the process continues today. 
Right now, the federal uh, safety programs in place, there's a lot of overlap. There is the, the, the main agency that's responsible for food safety and oversight is the Department of Health and Human Services. And under the Department of Health and Human, Ser Human Services is the, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, and the CDC. Um, the FDA carries the brunt of it right now. And also there's some role uh, with the Environmental Protection Agency, the U.S. Uh, de uh, Department of Agriculture. And these circles really should be bigger because there's quite a bit of overlap between these, mostly between um, USDA and uh, FDA. So what do, you, what do these agencies do? Well, under again, under DHHS, the Food and Drug Administration, um, they're the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition is responsible for the most part for regulating food plants, imported foods, food composition, ingredients. Uh, the CDC is responsible for rapid detection and surveillance, uh, any outbreak investigations. The USDA uh, is responsible for overseeing meat, poultry, and eggs, uh, proper labeling, uh, and they run the Food Safety and Inspection Service. Um, they also have the Cooperative State Research Education Extension Service, and that branch is research and education for farmers and consumers. There's the National Agricultural Library that provides, uh, it's a big multimedia uh, database, educational materials for foodborne illness. So if you ever need to do a talk on foodborne illness, there's a good resource. And then the EPA regulates the fishing industry, fishing industry and water quality, uh, use of pesticides. Now under the FDA, um, the, again, there, there's quite a bit of regulatory activity and um, we'll see how effective it's been. In 1998, the Food Safety Initiative um, was started and the, a, a coordinating group of individuals from various agencies was organized. They were called the Food Outbreak Response Coordinating Group, or Force G, because we like those those names. Um, and then 2002, the Public Health Security and Bioterrorism Preparedness and Response Act um, came about after the 2001 terror attacks in New York City. And the goal of all of this regulatory activity and enactment of laws is to have um, a, a broad uh, and coordinated approach to preventing outbreaks, whether it's bioterrorism related or just, you know, something uh, just foodborne uh, manufacturer related. So what's happened to date, as of November 2007, the Food Protection Plan under another plan under the, the, the FDA is an attempt to coordinate all of those initiatives and regulatory guidances and to try to come up with a big, broad game plan, an action plan um, to coordinate all of this. So the Food Protection Plan covers food safety and food defense, well, whether it's terrorism, domestics and imports, the entire food supply pathway from source to plate. Uh, and it is comprehensive and collaborative, so it involves CDC, the entire Department of Health and Human Services, USDA, industry, um, science, researchers, uh, and international trade partners as well, uh, which there are many. And just in 2008, Congress appropriated about $200 million to support specifically the Food Protection Plan uh, uh, for food safety and, de and defense. So what it is, is it has three major arms. The most important arm that's being um, expanded right now is the prevention arm, uh, which is identifying uh, food supply vulnerabilities, increasing participation of industry, uh, including other countries, and increasing FDA presence beyond uh, United States borders, which you, you, we don't always think of the FDA having any involvement outside of our shores, but they do. Uh, and of course, education at all levels of the food supply, which that's a big issue. That's a, that's a problem. And uh, to, uh, 
before this, uh, we've done a pretty decent job of intervention, although we could do better. Uh, under the Food Protection Plan, um, the intervention, uh, they're looking at targeted risk-based interventions like at the point of manufacture and distribution. Uh, they are developing rapid detection systems, and there's a, a predictive risk-based evaluation for dynamic import compliance targeting. It's a predict program, program which is basically uh, a form of rapid detection. Response uh, is also being improved. We, we've most of the the efforts up until recently have uh, been focused on response and rapid emergency response, and we're doing better on that. But there's a an increased focus on increasing traceability uh, to reduce uh, impacts down the line during an outbreak. Uh, just uh, some interesting pictures that I found. The FDA does have uh, a number of mobile labs, and they have three trucks. There's a chemistry, a micro lab, and then there's a big database truck. You don't really, I think it's that one of those is in the middle. And um, they, it's $3 million worth of equipment in those three trucks. And they send them out and they go test lettuce for E. coli, e. coli H1, uh, 7 H1, I'm sorry, <laughs> tested for E. coli, sorry. Um, they can go send it to a farm and, and do all sorts of testing in an afternoon, tell you whether there's a, a pathogen uh, involved at the farm. And they've been mobilizing these quite a few, quite a few times lately. So I've found that interesting. There it does, it does, actually. They're prominently labeled. <laughs> All right, so um, besides the FDA, the USDA um, has its Food Safety Inspection Service, and they're mostly involved in food labeling, uh, safe handling, uh, educating the public. Um, you know, there's a the Be Food Safe campaign right now, which is new. There was, I don't know if anybody knew about the Fight Back campaign. Make sure you chill down your foods uh, promptly and store them promptly. So they do a, a lot of uh, public uh, public contact. And then just so you know what, what a recall classification means, uh, there are three classes of recalls. The most important one, of course, being class one, which is the a recall where there's a reasonable probability of serious adverse health consequences. Those are the ones that we usually hear about. So this is just an example of what you might find uh, on the FDA on the USDA website uh, of an outbreak. This is a recent recall, class one recall, health risk high, um, and they recalled uh, some uh, frozen egg rolls uh, for um, uh, salmonella. And these recall there are hundreds of recalls every day on a variety for a variety of reasons whether it's mislabeling you know something wasn't quite right but maybe not dangerous that's a class three but there's you go to the FDA website you can pull up on a number of things and you they do have a page for report for reporting a problem with foods so you can go there and they'll tell you what to do who to contact Now, the CDC is involved in surveillance, of course, and there's uh, a food diseases, foodborne diseases active surveillance network, which involves the CDC, USDA, and FDA. A lot of uh, overlap. And there are two arms to it. The, the food net arm is the epidemiologic arm. Uh, and they do population, there's a team uh, across the nation. They do population-based surveillance for lab-confirmed cases of Salmonella, Campylobacter, Listeria, um, E. coli, Shigella, and uh, Vibrio and Yersinia. They've done that since 1996. Uh, Cryptosporidium and Cyclospora were added in 1997. Um, and uh, in 2004, they started uh, tracking outbreak-related Salmonella and E. coli 157. FoodNet uh, involves 10 state and local public health uh, laboratories across the nation. Um, and one, it's been useful in tracking uh, foodborne uh, illness in terms of the Healthy People 2010 objectives. 
Uh, for just an ex as an example, there, the objective for next year for salmonella species were to reduce the number of salmonella species from 13.7 cases per 100,000 uh, that the initiative uh, that started in 1997 to 6.8 per 100,000. And their salmonella rate in uh, last year was 16.2 cases per 100,000, so we're not there. Uh, in fact, we were a little bit worse. But if you're looking at FoodNet, you know, the, the one positive that, that they found is even looking back um, uh, the last you know, four years uh, across the pathogens, there really hasn't been a whole lot of change, even with the couple of salmonella outbreaks thrown thrown in as well. Salmonella in particular didn't really change uh, very much at all. But there, uh, obviously, we still have a ways to go. We're not doing too bad, but we still have a ways to go. Uh, the laboratory arm uh, of surveillance is PulseNet. That's the National Mo Molecular Subtyping Network for Foodborne Disease Surveillance. Um, and that involves the 10 uh, uh, state labs uh, under the Emerging Infections Program, as well as the uh, federal agency labs, the so USDA and FDA. And they all do a standardized pulse, gel field, pulse field gel electrophoresis uh, for various foodborne disease causing bacteria. And that uh, database is kept at CDC, and there's, they're the laboratories are able to communicate amongst uh, themselves on the PulseNet listserv. So it's real-time com communication that's possible. They can identify clusters early and identify critical points for intervening in processes. And there is a, a national, uh, an international network as of 2007 of PulseNet laboratories and those are growing. Now, <laughs> that's what's in place. What, what's, how's it really working? And I just have to say, is if anybody's looking for a job, the FDA is opening five uh, offices uh, overseas. They've got, they're hiring already in China and India, just so you know. <laughs> they have an office. All right, so let's go through how it's working. In November 2006, PulseNet alerts the CDC that they've noted a number of an, a sharp uptick in their cases of Salmonella, Tennessee, uh, as compared in uh, in November as compared to um, October. Excuse me, as compared to earlier months. Uh, so the investigation starts there. They went to, from about five cases per month to 30 in one week. Uh, PulseNet, uh, uh, on performing testing, noted that there were clustering of closely three closely related strains, and they were associated with consumption of peanut butters. FoodNet. Uh, uh, performed some food consumption surveys, and they know they found that uh, the cases more cases more like were more likely than their matched controls or general population to have eaten peanut butter, 81% versus 65%, to have eaten peanut butter more than once a week, and to have eaten Peter Pan or Great Value brands. There weren't any other brands associated with illness as of uh, February 13th. That was their finding. February 14th, can't read that very well, the FDA issued a health alert and ConAgra Foods recalled all of their lots of peanut butter and peanut butter containing products, um, Peter Pan and, and um, their great value that started with uh, the numbers 2111. And at that point of the recall, you notice that the cases start to decline. So as of their update uh, on March 1st, 2007, they noted that the, the, the FDA was continuing to work closely with CDC to identify how the, con the contamination occurred in order to prevent similar foodborne outbreaks. That's the last we heard about that one. Now, let's fast forward to 2008, 2009. Um, 
We had another multi-state outbreak of salmonella infections associated with peanut butter and peanut butter containing products. This time salmonella typhimurium. On November 10th, uh, 2008, PulseNet uh, uh, notes an uptick in salmonella typhimurium isolates in 12 states, 13 cases, and they notice an unusual uh, electrophoresis pattern um, that they uh, they hadn't seen this before. It's completely new. OutbreakNet, which is sort of related to FoodNet, but they just handle all sorts of outbreaks. Uh, started an epidemiologic review. This is also under CDC, and uh, on the 25th of November. And at, by that point, there were 35 isolates. They found that uh, there wasn't much difference between cases and general population controls eating chicken, but 77 cases versus 50, 59 controls did eat peanut butter. So the investigate the investigation continued along those lines. On the 16th of January 2009, the Connecticut Department of Public Health uh, isolated the outbreak strain uh, in an unopened container of king nut peanut butter. And then also, uh, during the epi epidemiologic investigation, 16 clusters were noted to be institutional facilities that only used king nut brand peanut butter. Uh, along other lines, uh, there are non-institutional non -institutional, uh, related cases that are tracked to peanut peanut containing products uh, and their products that uh, using paste that were was processed by the Peanut Corporation of America. They also processed King Nut products. Uh, oddly enough, and there doesn't seem to be an association, but this plant was 70 miles from the plant that was implicated in 2006-2007, also in Georgia. Uh, and also the Canadian Food Safety Inspection Service obtained some samples uh, from a case. Uh, and a patient who had, uh, had been to Oregon, uh, they obtained some samples of Austin uh, brand crackers that cultured positive also for the outbreak strain. This was at a private laboratory. So on January, on January 9th, PCA stops production of its peanut butter and peanut paste at its uh, Blakely, Georgia plant. They recalled all product that was date that dated back to July 1st. Actually, it should be January 1st, uh, 2008, uh, on the 16th. And uh, up until up up until the latest uh, update, there are at least 2,000 accounts and sub accounts that are being uh, tracked by CDC. The number, uh, and this is actually an, an earlier. So this is from. Uh, this is a slide from January. So at that point, the number of laboratory confirmed cases were 529. But there is, you see, there's a distrib. This is a, a nationwide outbreak. There's distribution th across the nation. And if you look at the the FDA's um, product list, recall list, there are at least 3,000, almost 4,000 entries of recalled product. 2006, 2007 was the first uh, uh, incidence of salmonella being associated with peanut butter and peanut products uh, in an outbreak. This is the this is the second, and this is the largest uh, foodborne related outbreak uh, in history. And you see, once the um, this this is just actually this just illustrates the the lag time. There's about a two-week lag time between onset of illness and onset of um, uh, reporting. Now in February of this year, the Texas uh, Department of State Health Services investigated PCA's Texas plant. They found rodent droppings in break room cabinets and dead rodents all over the facility, uh, multiple entry points for rodents. Live uh, flower, beetle, flower beetles in the blancher room, uh, dead flower beetles and screens in, in the bleacher room, uh, a lot of dead, in, dead insects inside the plant. And, <laughs> yeah, that's gross. I promise you no gross pictures, I'm sorry. Um, that's a dead rat right next to a bag of peanuts. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, 
if you had a high, if this were a higher resolution fi picture, you could also see insects all around. Yeah. Um, these are these are reusable um, bags for transportation. These are all smeared with peanut peanut butter, peanut paste. Um, they were ready for transportation. This is an intake vent, an air intake vent. This actually has never been cleaned, and this actually goes to um, the the clean room where product is ready to to go out. No, well, there's some of their their bugs attached to it, but it's mostly dust and dirt and <laughs> the former rodents. <laughs> so. This uh, this company was only four years old. Um, it resulted, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it never it didn't. That was four years worth, I guess, of of dirt. But it's only four years old. It it resulted in the largest commercial food related outbreak in history. Um, what they did, and they they actually operated without a food manufacturer's license from the, from the state for all that time. And that's why they, they they finally got shut down, along with the the results of that investigation. But um, what they were doing is they sent would send samples for the routine screening for salmonella, and they would come back positive. And it's like, oh dang, so test it again. <laughs> and so of course they would test it, and it would always come back negative. And say, so, okay, fine, let it go, let it move. And they actually have emails documenting those communications, releasing product after the tests come back negative. There are stages where they're they're supposed to be if they were following guidelines. There are stages where they're supposed to test product. Um, they're supposed to be, you know, after for for some products where there is the heating uh, step. For example, with the peanuts, usually there's a it's not raw. They have to they heat them at some point, either in the paste step or earlier on in the process where they're just uh, roasting the peanuts. It has to reach a certain temperature temperature to kill salmonella. And you know there's there's supposed to be all these quality control and safety testing, and they keep they're supposed to keep logs. They had a lot of trouble finding these tests to be the the initial tests, and they also had trouble finding the ones that they they did subsequently. So there's very poor record keeping. Um, all of that all of that information is supposed to be readily available to an FDA inspector that when they walk in, they're supposed to release it and they, they weren't able to do that. So yes, um, they did skip a lot of steps. So all told, um, almost 700 cases of illness later uh, that we are aware of, uh, and nine deaths that we are aware of uh, related to this outbreak. PCA uh, was fined $14.6 $14 billion. Uh, they filed promptly for bankruptcy and there are FBI and congressional investigations uh, ongoing. The FDA itself is under review. Um, it's, uh, this may be a rumor, but uh, PCA's president, Stuart Parnell, who's this guy, uh, is supposedly on the USDA Peanut Standards Board, which sets the quality and handling standards for peanuts. I'm not sure who made that decision, but anyway. I think I No. <laughs> he politely declined a taste of his product. <laughs> all right. So anyway, even with all of the regulatory stuff and all these people that are paid to, you know, oversee the industry, uh, we've had a couple of major outbreaks. So the oversight, and it's just like in all of, as I'm going through all of this, it's just like infection control. You can tell people what to do. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink. So it, there has to be some ownership and leadership uh, from the industry. The good news is, based on what I was, what I've reviewed so far, there seem there the eyes are opening and they're starting to get it. Uh, on March 24th, for example. 
Uh, Kraft Foods informed the FDA that its Becton H or Trail mix, mix tested positive for salmonella. It already started a recall of its product down the line on its own, uh, and it had traced uh, the product back to Sutton Foods, the, the contamination back to Sutton Foods pistachios. Uh, and they communicated that information promptly to the FDA. And based on that, uh, the product was recalled and the FDA was able to issue a health alert. There have been no, um, the other companies have, have subsequently, subsequently, Richie and company um, have uh, recalled uh, pistachio products based on that alert. And there haven't been any uh, illnesses reported related to that uh, to date. And that's the way it's supposed to work. In an ideal world, that's the way it's supposed to work. And again, there are many, many uh, such instances on, a, on an annual basis. And usually, it, that's the way it works. Again, industry uh, is starting to wake up. Uh, and with the, the Peter Pan uh, peanut butter outbreak in 2007, ConAgra, Really responded fairly aggressively compared to previous, uh, uh, compared to to other companies. Um, ConAgra lost 60 million dollars uh, related to that outbreak in 2007. They conducted their own internal investigation and uh, found that moisture had inter inadvertently entered the production process, and they 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 felt that allowed some growth of salmonella that was probably coming from raw peanuts. Uh, even though the FDA officially hasn't acknowledged that that was the source, that's what they feel. So based on their um, investigations, they they completely refurbished their plant in Sylvester, Georgia. And so they shut it down, they remodeled it, they installed new state-of-the-art machinery, technology, um, invested a lot of money in it before they reopened it in August. They also went a little bit further. They realized that they don't know diddly, at the time, they didn't know diddly about food safety, uh, or at least not enough to, to have prevented that problem. Uh, so they appointed a uh, recognized and well-respected food safety F expert as a vice president of global food safety uh, to, to consolidate the responsibility under one person. And that person uh, subsequently formed a food safety advisory committee with multiple experts. Uh, they recognized that, that really external oversight uh, was not enough. They couldn't depend, they, they really can't depend on uh, just the government to tell them what to do and, and to oversee because they lose money. There are many. Um, and actually, AMR research is, um, is a, conducts. Um, AMR Research is a company that, that yeah, really. AMR Research is a company that that conducts surveys uh, of uh, production and manufacturing for for industry. In 2007, they surveyed 251 food companies trying to ask, uh, trying to answer those questions, and they found that under two percent uh, that processed fruits and vegetables and actually inspected them. Under 40% uh, had a, a mechanism for identifying and tracking uh, items across the supply chain from uh, source to uh, retailer. Under 35% actually will track the source, the supplier, or distributor quality. Uh, for example, only half uh, may pre-qualify or evaluate their, their suppliers or their sources uh, or, and certify their quality. Fewer actually do on-site audits. So even those that, that pre-qualified don't actually go to the source and, and inspect um, what's going on. And 10% have no mechanism whatsoever to ensure the purity of their ingredients. They just don't have a system to do that. It's, you know, there's a lot of complacency in, in oh, the government does that or somebody else does that. But there's not, hasn't been a whole lot of ownership. Um, so in 2007, 67% of food, com food companies with over $5 billion in sales had recalls that cost over $20 million. Uh, for example, the salmonella uh, outbreak related to pet foods in 2007 cost $42 million, uh, resulted in 90 lawsuits, 5,300 5, products were recalled, and 100 pets died. 
um, in October 2007, Topps Foods, uh, which was a major producer for ground beef, uh, had an outbreak and it closed after 57 years of a very successful business and being an industry leader. Uh, they also found it takes about 18 days to detect a problem and initiate a recall, which is pretty close to what the CDC has found with FoodNet. It takes 42 days to get any product back, and only about 42% 42, 42 of recalled product can actually be traced uh, or pinned down. And that it's a little bit difficult because at least in the in recent outbreaks, the FDA recommends that product if you have product on the shelf, just throw it out or bag it, throw it out, wash your hands, and, and get rid of it. They don't tell the, they don't, unless there's a, um, a money back uh, offered, they just tell them to destroy it. So there's no way for them to track product. And, you know, there are companies that are, they, they see what's happening and the money that's lost and how it, ConAgra really suffered for a good while in the industry from, uh, loss of confidence, both from their investors and from consumers. So their companies are trying to do the right thing. Maple Leaf Foods uh, manufactures pork product. It's a Six, six Sigma company. Uh, in 2004, it started a DNA traceability plan. They, they, would they, it's a big initiative. They thought, oh, well, the customers should, consumers should know where their product is coming from. So you, let's do this, and we can tra trace any pork product uh, that we sell back to the maternal sow. <laughs> <laughs> they thought it was a good idea. Uh, in 2008, they still had a listeria outbreak. Um, it cut sales 55%. They had $25 million in a class action settlement. Since then, they went back and they looked at, the, at what ConAgra did, which ConAgra did a lot in the industry. Um, they did the same thing. They established a chief food safety officer. They now have a food safety advisory council. It's prominent on their website. They have this 40-step plan, um, 40 steps to food safety. And, uh, you know, they, they're learning. We, we don't know enough about what we're supposed to be doing, so let's find people who know and, and get them to help us. Uh, there, are, there are 40 steps to food safety. They have an annual third-party facility audit. They have um, risk assessments, and, you know, they look at the state of the art with sanitation. They are aligning with co-packers that share those food safety specifications, so if they have to outsource or use third parties, they can be feel confident in their performance. And that what was interesting about them is they're actually linking compliance to the 40 steps to leadership compensation and performance reviews. Money talks. Yeah. And they also were looking at doing crisis preparedness. They, quarterly, they have simulated product recalls, you know, to try and sort out what the problems, you know, do the process review and, and do root cause analysis to see things that they can fix, which is different and new in the industry. And another, you know, part of all of this, um, there is an increasing em emphasis on that process analysis and quality control. You know, an infection control. Do you guys have um, uh, that a database, a data mining program? Do you have Theradoc or? Yeah, yeah we do too. <laughs> um, but if you're able to pool all of your data, if you can, you have a, an IT related way to track your processes and you know what's happening here. If you have a way for to have automated alarms go go off and alert you that you know, you know roaster X is the temperatures are off, you can fix that in real time. And that uh, that. Uh, technology and that software is now available. There's a couple that, that I saw, you know, um, the, the one that ConAgra Foods has chosen is Infinity QS. It's, uh, uh, it's one means of doing that. And it's uh, basically statistical, statistical process uh, control software. There's another one uh, called the Gain Seeker Suite by Hertzler Systems. There's uh, uh, these, and what's interesting is these companies are are not publicly traded. They're private companies. They got a lot of money um, invested in this, and they're going to get a lot more money, and they know it. So there's the money again. Money is talking. So 
key points to to all of this food safety is food safety is really like infection control uh, or monitoring any process there are uh, more rules and more government oversight is great but it's it's really only half the story the the people who are actually doing the work and processing the food have to know what they're doing and why they're doing it so education of industry and the public uh, research into foodborne uh, uh, illness and outbreaks is important and it's ongoing. The industry itself needs to pr improve its practices and its knowledge and they know it. Uh, money, they have uh, tremendous losses of money and consumer confidence and investor confidence in recent years and it's and especially now with the economy it's really it's really hurting and they know how much more they stand to lose without investing in it. So they're learning to lead. And then of course, you know, the the there we have technology and software and we need to just start implementing it. And I just wanted to throw in a piece of trivia trivia. How why why do we have such a problem now with salmonella outbreaks and salmonella illnesses in humans? I didn't, did people used to, you know, did you have to cook your eggs all the way, you know, when your grand, you know, grandpa, did he have to do, they didn't really have all that, that much salmonella enteritis in the early 19, 1900s. What really happened is in the, in the poultry industry, they noticed that salmonella, I'm sorry, similar, yeah, growth promoters. They, the way antibiotics were used as quote unquote growth promoters. Well, in the early 1900s, they uh, noted that a lot of poultry uh, were colonized with Salmonella, Pilara, and Gallinorum, and they were associated with illness. They were also associated with uh, lower growth rates. So the this big plan to uh, improve the National Poultry Improvement Plan, the USDA started a National Poultry Improvement Plan, um, and then there's also a UK UK program that started to improve the health of poultry by eliminating these strains of Salmonella. Well, what happened is when the chickens have the there's a lot of the, the Salmonella and uh, Polara and Gallinorum running around in the in the population, they have antibodies, and those antibodies provide cross protection to salmonella and aridus. As soon as there wasn't, uh, the, yeah, as soon as these other strains weren't there, then the salmonella and aridus became endemic. So now um, almost all flocks uh, of poultry and a lot of birds, um, turkeys, are colonized with salmonella and aridus. They're growing pretty good, even though they've eliminated the antibiotic thing too. <laughs> You can. <laughs> so that that's why. Um, there, and actually, if I don't know if you can see it from back there, but they tracked the human cases per year as the these chickens colonization decreased, the cases of human Salmonella and Aridus increased, both in the U.S. and in the U.K. Same thing happened. So there we are. Now that's why we're stuck with uh, Salmonella and Aridus in our in our eggs.